Welcome to Renewal at 50 Plus. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you listening now and those listening later. And sorry if there was any problem for folks getting on, I'll look into that. And thank you for those who've introduced yourself. If you haven't, please go into the chat, say hello, and let us know where you're from. And today, we're talking about a really relevant, terrific topic, which is all about how to create an executive presence that makes you more marketable. And we have a very special guest who I'll introduce in a minute. I just want to share one really interesting statistic on executive presence. And that is that a survey by Gartner of thousands of CIOs found that executive presence was actually the number two, the number two trait that they listed for in terms of what's needed to be a leader. And that far surpassed technology skills, which came in at number 10. Also, executive right. presence is very important if you want to get promoted, particularly into a leadership position. And today we have the absolute maestro of executive <laughs> presence, Rob Salafia. And I'm just so thrilled to have a conversation with him. And Rob has such a fascinating background. He began his career actually as a performance artist and traveled around the world doing one man shows. And he has since become, and I'm hoping he'll share a little bit with us of how he's done this, but he's since become an executive coach. He's a facilitator and coach at MIT Sloan School of Management. He's an author, a speaker, an all-around great guy, <laughs> and I'm um, uh, excited uh, to have him here. So welcome, Rob. Wendy, I'm delighted to be here on, on your program, and it's a very relevant topic for me since I am quite a few years now past 50. <laughs> well, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, Loving it, actually. Yeah. Um, why don't you start, Rob, sharing uh, very briefly your journey, how you got from well, thanks. Per performance artists to where you are now? Well, you know, that's, uh, I, I've had one of those nonlinear careers and nonlinear lives where I started in one direction and moved in another. In college, I was a geography major, I was, uh, international development, and I found myself in, as a junior in college in Kathmandu, Nepal for a semester of school. And it was a pretty interesting, very cathartic time, 20 years old, 1975. At the end of three months, I went to Northern India and took a 10 day Vipassana mindfulness meditation course. Now think about that, 20, I was 20 years old. That's like 1975, very different world back then. You know, no cell phones. No, you know, I mean, it was it was pretty interesting. The thing that I found remarkable, I'll tell you one story. I'm standing on the train platform going up to the meditation retreat, and this young man came up to me, and he was exactly my age, and he was from a Sikh family. Uh, and uh, if you've seen individuals with uh, from India with, with turbans on and and beards. That's the that's this this uh, sect of religion, and uh, and he asked me what I was doing. He wanted to practice his English, and then he said, "You know, where are you going?" I told him what I was where I was doing, and I had a couple of days, you know, to go sightsee. And he said, "Would you like to come and visit with my family?" Which I did, and I spent two days with him, his his sister, his mom, and his dad. And every night, two nights in a row, I went for a long walk with his dad who was an amazing person. He was in the government, um, you know, uh, and he was so interesting. He had such deep knowledge and, and very thoughtful. And then they took me to their temple. 
And it was this, you know, very uh, circular temple. You know, it had uh, everyone was crowd. You know, it was a, a big audience in attendance. And then they had a tabla player and two harmonium players. This is like a, a drummer and these little organ players. And the, it was so soulful, the music. And I was looking around saying, this is amazing. And that, that whole idea of being open to new experiences. Uh, when I got back home, it was difficult for me to anyway to, um, it, it was a little bit of a, a, a culture shock, reverse culture shock. I didn't end up becoming a geography and international development person. I ended up taking a left-hand turn, went into theater. I became a street performer. I became a juggler, tap dancer, rope and wire walker, and I did a lot with audience participation. I did street theater and stage theater as well. And the lessons that I learned in theater were remarkable. And so I'd love to share a couple with you, but any thoughts, any uh, questions that you might have given that little part of the journey so far? Oh, well, thank you, uh, Rob, for sharing that. And what made you go um, from being the street performer to becoming an executive coach and an expert in uh, executive presence? And just well, tell us uh, briefly, and then I'd like to talk about what executive presence is Perfect. and why we should care about it. Perfect. Well, as a performer, uh, I learned many skills. And one thing, a major lesson I learned from one of my theater directors was that it's not about the skill, it's about the experience you want to create for your audience. And so there was, that's one of many lessons that I learned in theater. At 35, I was still, I had almost made it. I, I was cast in a theater show that was supposed to go to Broadway, but it, it never quite got off the ground. I was, I was cast as the lead in it. And I'm 35 and I'm looking around and I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have much money in the bank. And I thought, mm, I think I start, I think I better make a shift, a transition. And so I hired a career consultant and I really, it was the first time I had asked myself on a lot of these questions because right out of college, I went into theater. Questions like, uh, you know, values, what's important to me? Um, how do I want to make a difference in the world? Uh, transferable skills. I got it so well that they ended up hiring me. And then six months later, I was in a conversation with a very good friend of mine at Boston University who ran a program for people with disabilities, emotional disabilities, and he needed a job developer. Well, guess what? I got hired as their job developer because that's what I was doing. And it was part half sales. It was also I was developing and learned clinical and counseling skills because I was trained as a as a rehabilitation counselor. I, I went over to the personnel office at BU and I introduced myself to the woman that uh, ran the university training group. And she invited me to join that. So I started to teach corporate training classes around campus. So this was sort of like I taught what I most needed to learn. And then I also got my master's in business. So in five years, I put 15 years of career development. You know, I was I was I learned all about different companies across the, the, the city of Boston, from nonprofits to banks, because I was learning how to find and develop uh, positions uh, within these organizations for people with disabilities. And then all of the other skill set. And I looked and I had an amazing skill set. I could be in front of any audience. I learned how to coach and and work with people uh, who were highly sensitive and I also really got excited about corporate learning. I leveraged my background in theater. So that's one lesson I learned is that you bring all your experience with you. And as we grow into uh, whatever age we're at, and so we don't put our experiences to, be, you know, we, we don't shelve our experiences. We bring them with us. Yeah, I want to underscore that point because... Like you, I've had a multifaceted uh, career journey, and now, at least on my fifth, I've kind of lost track. But what, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> but what I found is that, like you're, as you're saying, Rob, it's each different career. You bring what you did before. You're not, yeah. it's not like you say goodbye to that, but you take that with you and become something more. Cause something more. That's what I, I, I really like that. So in, in this transition, one of the, one of my friends who I did some of the corporate training around campus with said, Rob, I'm learning to become a coach. Let me coach you. And I said, fine. He says, what do you want? And it was the first time that I could truly answer that question because I had this great skill set. I said, I want to be recognized by what I, for what I have to offer by, I'd like to be introduced to two or three consulting companies. Clear as a bell. Two weeks later, I'm in Harvard Square and I meet an old friend of mine. He has this woman with him who was the head of HR for Societe Generale, the French investment bank. He was working for this company that used theater methodology to teach storytelling and leadership communication skills. <laughs> I, I ran after that one as hard as I could because it, it, it was a perfect fit. And I ended up being their top sales executive for 12 years. Ran the relationship with American Express. Harvard Business School was one of my top clients. So I'm still very good friends with uh, quite a few of the faculty across campus there. Well, that's a great story. And then how did you go from there to actually coaching yourself? Well, in theater, coaching is always, uh, coaching is a part of theater. You're always, as you learn something, you have to turn around and teach somebody else. Mm -hmm. So always the, the apprentice model of learning was, was part and parcel and of, of my theater education. So helping someone to learn a skill, helping someone to improve, helping someone to embrace a role, helping someone to be more self-reflective, all of these skill sets were in the world of theater. However, uh, after 12 years of working within this other organization, I stepped out to run my own company, which I do now call Protagonist Consulting Group. As a bridge, I reached out to uh, a friend of mine that was running an executive coaching certification program at William James College. It used to be called Massachusetts School for Professional Psychology in Newton. She said it would be a perfect program for me. And it really was because it took my knowledge of coaching to a deeper level. You know, the psychological frameworks of cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, positive psychology. Those are the areas that I like to work in. You know, cognitive psychology, understanding your triggers, the things that, um, you know, uh, um, the way you uh, approach the world. A developmental psychology, adult stages of development, and then positive psychology, which is really sort of the focus of my book on uh, developing and leading from your best self. But I'm a story guy. So I love the developmental psychology piece, you know, digging into your story, understanding who you were then, who you are now, and who you're growing into becoming. Uh, yeah, I will love the way that you describe that in terms of storytelling. And I think in a way that relates to executive presence, because part of, as I see it, part of executive presence is being able to have a coherent story, be able mm -hmm. to share it with others and get them excited. Why don't we, yes. for the uh, audience's sake, uh, hone in for a minute, Rob, on in terms of what executive presence is all about, Perfect. how you define Yes. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I really see it as, let's, let's, let's break it up. So presence itself is, from my perspective, uh, when you have access to all those different parts of yourself, there's an internal component to it, an internal self-awareness and an external self-awareness. So the internal self-awareness are your values, your motivations, uh, the things that comprise who you are inside of you. Uh, your external is the impact that you have on others. And the way I like to frame executive presence is in a unique way. Uh, it's how people experience you. It's how they experience themselves when they're with you it's the story they tell about you when you're gone, when you've left the room. Uh, 
So how many ways can people experience you? They can experience you energetically. So how you show up, do you have a bright energy or a dull energy? Physically, some people have a bright smile on their face. Some people are very imposing. Some people are very slight. They have a physical presence to them. Vocally. Some people have a very high voice and thin whisper. Some people are very low and deep and have very deep resonance. James Earl Jones comes to mind. And then emotionally. And we all lead with one of these. These are areas from a theater, anyway, that we can actually develop. But if we get to understand how people experience us, maybe relationally, what are the words that come to mind? All of them work congruently together but we have to be aware that some people lead with one of those more than the other. And so I, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, uh, Rob, are you s- tr- suggesting that it's better to lead with one of them than another, or you simply adapt to whatever your strengths are in terms of what you lead with? Sure. It's First is building that awareness of how do people experience you? And when you read the first chapter of my book, I have a really, really interesting uh, self-led 360 that you can do and ask people these questions. You know, how do you experience me? You know, have you seen me uh, how, when I've shown up as the best version of myself? What words come to mind? You know, how have I influenced the people in the environment around me? This is really good information. It's kind of like doing a uh, strengths finder uh, exercise but through the experience of other people. And I think that's the unique perspective here is that it's how other people experience you because we want to get that, as you said, congruent, how we perceive ourselves and how other people perceive us. That's your baseline that you have to work with. Yeah, that's such a very useful exercise. I actually have my clients do that in terms of personal branding and have them go out and ask maybe a handful of people how they perceive them in a few words. And often there's a disconnect between how we see ourselves and how others perceive us. And like you're saying, the key is to merge the two. So then let's take the second one. It's how other people experience themselves when they're with you. And there's a quote by uh, Joshua Margolis from Harvard Business School, one of the faculty there. He says, uh, leadership is about how other people experience themselves in your presence. And I find that really remarkable because it makes you shift from your perspective to another person's perspective. You put your feet in their shoes and say, how you know, do you create an environment that allows ideas to thrive. So the question I like to ask people is, have you ever felt small in someone else's presence before? Have you ever felt large in someone else's presence before? And in each one of those, what does it do to your ideas? To uh, Do you share your ideas freely or do you feel yourself get a little bunkered and, and withdraw? Yeah, I really uh, love that. And I have certainly, as I'm sure everybody listening has had that experience where sometimes you really feel elevated in somebody's presence. They make you feel so comfortable. Other times somebody kind of puts the screws on you and you feel uncomfortable and you don't act your best self. And that's uh, so, so true. I've been thinking a little bit, Robin, maybe you can explain the difference between charisma and executive presence, because I've met politicians, as I'm sure you have, and they just ooze that charisma. And yet there's something not quite there in terms of executive. It's a that I I, I love answering this question. And I I think of it like this. Uh, Charisma is a powerful you know, when you meet somebody, they're energized, you know, they, they light up the room, they light you up. So if it, have you ever been to a, if you've ever been to a meeting and in a room and you have a leader that's very charismatic and the ideas are flying around the table and it's just really energized. Then the person says, I have to go keep up the work. I'll see you later. And they leave and all the energy leaves with them. Yeah. And then everyone just like goes, Oh, well, what do we do now? It's like that sort of charisma. It's like it leaves with the person. Uh, 
Whereas an authentic energy, one that you create an environment that allows ideas to thrive, when you leave, the energy stays in the room and people feel empowered. They feel um, energized. They feel like they, you, they've been given uh, the green light. They have permission to, to, to bring all the ideas forward. So they're not all generated from you, uh, that you've created that environment that allows people and ideas to thrive. Yeah, that, that really explains it so well, Rob, the idea that uh, the charismatic people take all the good stuff out with them when they, when they yeah. depart, while those who have executive presence empower you so you can right. continue can you give us a few tips on how we can improve and create our executive presence? Well, sure. If you think about the framework about how many different ways people can experience you, so energetically, physically, vocally, emotionally. So let's take each one of those and one thing for each one. So energetically, uh, if you think about uh you know, the, in your morning, are, are you a morning person or an, or an afternoon person or an evening person? If you've gone from, you know, our days are meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Have you ever felt yourself rolling in hot to one of that next meeting? If you do, you realize that you're, you haven't modified your energy. Your ener you're carrying energy from the prior conversation or maybe several conversations ago. And maybe that didn't go so well. And so, being able to ground ourselves. And I have a, a good solid practice to do this. I do this every day. I have a breathing exercise practice. I have meditation practice every morning. And I make sure that I think about, I separate what I just came from. I go into a pause point, take a deep breath. I have a, an acronym called Breathe Connect Land. It's a self-regulation um, uh, tool. We take a breath in, you connect with the purpose of the meeting that you're walking into, you land in that intention. You think about who's going to be there, how do you want to show up, uh, what, the, what what's the topic, what's your point of view for that, what would success look like for you? Just a quick series of questions, you take another breath, you settle in, and then you enter into that meeting. And so... People, they might not exactly know what they're experiencing, but they feel like you're more fully present there. So being present as much as possible before you go into a meeting is fantastic. Now that physically, so I'll tell you a story. When I first went in behind a desk after becoming a performing artist, now when I was a performer, I had to be energized. I had to be my face, body, voice, and emotion, everything. I was had to energize my audience. So I always had a smile. I was big. When I went to work, I was a grinder, right? So I had this face on like this, you know, working <laughs> like this. I was a grinder. You know, it's like I wanted to make it happen. And if I needed to go to the printer down the hall, I would still wear this face. And until a friend of mine let me know that I was wearing this face, you know, sending the message, you know, hey, I'm, I'm important, you know, and, uh, and you might be not as important and people were experiencing me as kind of like, kind of a jerk, you know, so my brand. And then she said something that was really cool. She said, see every exit as an entrance to someplace new. And I, when I heard that, I went, that, that, that's right, I really like that. So what does that mean? I wasn't leaving my office. I was walking into, the new, in, into that new space. So I began to practice. I began, and it was hard. I began to practice. I began to cultivate a resting smile. So I would just take a moment before I walked out, just even just a breath, just that pause point, walk out, walk into the new space. So little things like that make a big difference. Um, voice. So I work a lot with my voice. I, look, I, work, I do a lot of vocal work with people and I'm not a trained vocal technician. I, I have fun with it. 
But there's breathing points. This is what actors do. They have breathing points. They learn how to take a breath in. You breathe in and you speak out. If there's anything that we can learn how to do, it's that. And I you just, oh, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, I just was struck when you were talking about this with a very funny story. Years ago, I happened to meet Jackie Mason, of all people. And we went out. A Borscht like, Belt comedian. He was a yes, Borscht Belt comedian, yes, stand-up people, comedian. Yes, thank you. For people who don't know, we went to a little riot diner in a, a restaurant, coffee shop in Manhattan. And before we sit down, he was going to be performed that night. He starts exercising his voice in the restaurant and kind of does an exercise like you were talking about. But it was just so funny to see him do that in that environment like that. Definitely. Bobby, yeah. Because what it says is you don't just like, oh, I have this thing. I'm going to practice some voice. And then you forget about it. So it takes it's something that you build into your daily routine. It's practice. And you learn how to take a breath in and you speak out on the column of air. You learn how to develop resonance wide. Um, the funny one that I like, the funny phrase I like to use is from Star Wars. Luke, I am your father. Right. So it's a nice, big, wide voice. You learn how to speak big and wide and then learn how to when uh, spit your words out like Shakespeare, they say, if you're not spitting, it's not Shakespeare. You have to spit your words out and articulate. So those three things, breathing, resonance and articulation are two of the uh, are three of the most powerful things that you can do to help enhance and develop a, a, a good, strong vocal presence and cadence. When you say cadence, Rob, what do you exactly do you mean by so that? So some people speak really quickly. Okay. Some people take their time a little bit too much. It's developing a nice vocal cadence. So you breathe in and then you're able to speak out on a column of air. And then you have a natural pause point. That natural pause point is very important because it allows other it allows the ideas to sink into the other person's uh, mind. It also gives them an opportunity to enter in so that you're not just continually talking. I work with a lot of executives that come from cultures where if you stop talking, someone else will jump in and then you've lost the floor. And so they fight. So they just don't even stop at all. Uh -huh. There comes a time, especially when you grow in an organization that you need to learn how to uh, land your messages with impact. Uh, Rob, maybe we could, for the audience sake, do a little demonstration with sure. myself as the guinea pig uh, about uh, demonstrating a little bit about executive presence. So that's great. So, Wendy, if you could move in just a little bit closer to the screen, that'd be great. So this was something that you and I worked on the other day. When we were talking and speaking the other day, I found that you were looking at a different side of the screen. So it was almost like you were doing this. And I was on a, I was on a sales call one time with someone, and he was actually looking up like this. And I said, Paul, where are you looking? He goes, I'm looking right at you. I said, no, you're not. I'm over here. So he was looking at my image on the screen. This is virtual. But the same things apply when you're in person. I said, we have to train ourselves to look into the camera because when people are looking at our image, we want them to feel as though we're, feel as though we're looking at them. Then when they talk, you can look away. So if you were to try that, just um, do it one way where you're not looking and then switch your eyes and really land your messages to me directly into the camera. All right. This is where I'm not looking into the camera and I'm probably not that animated. Now I'm looking into the camera. I feel I have more presence and I'm enthusiastic and loving it. So what I just noticed was when you were just speaking and not into the camera, your face was kind of had a flat affect to it. 
And there's the same thing happened the other day. As soon as you had an intention to look into the camera, your eyes crinkled up, you were smiling with your eyes and your whole face brightened up. And I went, oh, okay, you have something to say and you're excited about that. So those little things, we don't realize how powerful they are. Just that little, uh, we bring energy to our face is uh the impact that that has on others is dramatic. It, it, it draws them in. And that's why we have, a, we have all of these uh, tools at our disposal, communication tools, our voice, our face, our body language, our hands and gestures, all of these things matter. And we have to learn how to ebb and flow and work with them and experiment with them and see what works. Yeah, that that you're right, Rob. It made such a big difference. And I I felt bigger too looking yeah. at the camera. Right, exactly. Exactly right. Uh why don't we open it up now to the audience and see if anybody has any questions? Sure. If you want to just put your question into the chat, um, if anybody has one. And I'm going to look over here myself. So if you see me looking away, it's because I'm looking at the chat right here myself. Yeah, me too. Barbara Hannon, love to have you here. <laughs> after she read the book, after Barbara read the book, it was all dog-eared and she had all these little pieces of paper sticking out of it. It's like she dug into it. Okay, Barbara has a question. Yep. What can you do when one person dominates in a meeting? Ooh, right? So that happens a lot, doesn't it? One person um, continues to dominate. There's a couple of ways that you can do. Um, this is sort of like how do, you, how do you insert or wedge yourself into a meeting? And so one of the techniques – that I've tried and I suggest is when there's a little bit of a pause point, you have to kind of like put the wedge in there and you can say just like a, a couple of words, like I have an idea I'd love to share and then pause and see if anyone turns to you. If people then turn to you and say, great. In other words, you have to create the space to speak. Another thing that you can do um, is build upon that person's idea. Sometimes it's almost like Aikido. Like if, if you're in karate, you're at, at the martial arts, you're going to, you don't want to punch the person directly and go, can you please be quiet? But you can kind of move with their forceful energy. And you can say, wow, I really liked Bob. I really liked that idea. And as a matter of fact, I've been thinking about that and I like to build upon that. And so all of a sudden you're building on someone else's idea. That person will feel, well, somewhat acknowledged. You have to play to the ego, I, I guess. And then it'll create that space for you to open up and insert your idea into the room. Uh, the other way is, is that person leading the meeting or is that person one of the folks that is not leading the meeting? You can sidebar after the meeting, talk to the leader of the meeting, whoever's running it, to say, I know that there's other people in the room that have a lot of great ideas to share. Is there some way that we could moderate uh, this, the next conversation so that we get more voices into the room? And that, that person can then um, you know, uh, take charge of the meeting and, and, you know, like, like one of the ideas, I was talking about this today with one of my coaching clients at MIT, I said, you know, uh, one of the rules of thumb, you could say, let's make sure that everyone's voice is in the room. So uh, if you share an idea, let's wait until everyone else's voice in the room bef gets in the room before you share a second idea. And so oh, that like moderates. That. That, that moderate. So there's a lot of these ideas out there, but I think... Um, we don't have to be subjected to the self-appointed, you know, expert in the room. Uh, the whole idea in leadership is that we're all there for a reason and we want to draw out the collective intelligence, get everyone's voice in the room. Uh, that reminds me of something I was reading recently, uh, Rob, about um, 
Jerry Seinfeld, how he would deal with a heckler. And somebody, what he would do is sort of what you were suggesting if somebody's dominating the conversation. He would en- actually engage with the heckler yes. and say, okay, why are you so angry? I see you have a problem. How can we help? And he was, he was the would, heckler therapist. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And I think that that's sort of the same concept of engaging with that person who's dominating and that you can kind of shut them up, I think, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We have another question from uh, Kathy McShane. She wanted to know if it was advisable to take a storytelling class. You know, uh, Kathy, I think that's a great idea. You know, so much so, and I'll give you a little bit of a history for me. When I, back in 1978, I got in my flat face van, drove down to Jonesboro, Tennessee, uh, to the Storytellers Convention, and and just immersed myself in the art form of storytelling. And then over many years, I learned many different forms of storytelling. When I came to um, become a, uh, uh, in, in corporate learning and use storytelling for leaders, uh, I started to learn, you know, really direct narrative storytelling. That's first person, present tense, sensory detail. That's me bringing my story to life so that you can walk with me in that story. And there's many different forms. And there's many people out there that are teaching. Some people are just storytellers and you can learn their form of storytelling. Now, here's an example. When I was at MIT, I saw in the newsletter that there was a storytelling class being taught by the 36-time Moth Story Champion. Now, if you know anything about the Moth stories out of New York City, this is a form of storytelling. It's very self-deprecating. It's people that share very kind of raw stories about uh, moments in their lives. So I went to this class, and I met this guy from Connecticut, and it was totally worth it. I've been doing this for 40 years but I went to a class and I walked out. I hired him <laughs> as a coach for a couple of sessions for him to, uh, from his perspective, you know, listen to my stories. And he coached me and I, I learned a ton. So Do you call his name, Rob. Um, uh, uh, yes, I'll, I, I will um, right off the top of my head. I, I can't even. All right. I, I, but I will. Um, let me see. Where's my, where's my, here it is right here. Matthew Dix um, here on Story Worthy. I'll put and that in the chat. How do you spell his last name? D I C K S. Okay. And then the other person I would greatly recommend is um, Paul Smith. Paul's a friend of mine, and uh, he wrote two books, actually, three or four books. This one is called Lead with a Story, Paul Smith. And that's a that's a really great book. He has Lead with a Story, Sell with a Story. And and if you're if you're interested right now I'll give you a really great tip on a storytelling technique that is really perfect for it's actually a sales technique. Uh, and it's in this article, and we'll uh, make sure we'll, we'll share the article. It's called The Art of Self-Promotion Without Being Self-Promoting. I, I wrote this article. And the idea is to not speak about your, yourself directly, but to speak about other people's experience of you. In other words, if I were to say, well, uh, my most recent client, what they appreciated about in me most was my ability to collaborate, that I didn't come in with all the answers, that I had a framework to work with, and that we created the program together. Uh, or I could say what they, um, what they found remarkable about my approach was that it wasn't a one-size-fits-all model, is that the design kind of addressed the individual needs of each person in the room. Right, so I don't, I'm not talking about myself. So it takes away that onus of like, going, oh, yeah, well, I'm a really great story. No, like use the words of others. 
And it comes right out of that same framework about um, uh, how other people experience you, that, that uh, 360 we were talking about. That's the same idea, too, about getting testimonials, where you have yes. a happy client saying how great you are and ex- yep. experiencing you rather than you saying I'm terrific. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I hope that uh, answers your question, Kathy. Do we sense. have any other questions? Rob, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like I could talk with you all day. This is so great, Wendy. A uh, real pleasure. And I'll be posting in a few days, I'll post a replay. Also, I have a companion podcast, also Renewal at 50 Plus, wherever you get your podcast. So this will be available as a podcast as well. And if anybody has any questions, wants to learn more, please feel free to contact me. I'm going to put my contact information in the chat as well. It's Wendy at thrivingat50plus.com. And we have uh, another exciting guest, uh, William Aruda for next month, who is Mr. Personal Branding. And I'll be posting about that and hope you can join us. Rob, thank you so, so, so very Wendy, much. I was, was going to say, if anyone wants to, uh, feel free to reach out to me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Very happy to do that. And uh, uh, my address is Rob Salafia at protagonistconsulting.com. Rob Salafia at, like the word protagonist? Protagonistconsulting.com. Okay. Wait, we have another question. How do you neutralize people with negative energy around you? Well, um, sometimes that's hard to do. The thing that I try and do most is not get pulled into their negative energy is to is I have a daily practice is to go into my own self, more deep breathing, take a deep breath, breathe, connect with. Uh, you know, a, a source of energy, source energy, connect with my higher self, land inside of myself, find that, uh, cultivate a state of positivity, bring that positivity around me, and then that'll influence the state. That That's one of the things that I try and do. Uh, I don't try and fight it. I don't try and complain about it. Uh, I try and not let it uh, trigger me or affect me. So you're suggesting, Rob, to stay very positive yeah. and not be influenced by that. Try not to be influenced by the negative energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, had another, we had another uh, question. Um, let me see where it is. How do you deliver bad news from Barbara Johnson? All right. Um, you know, it's always important to let people know that you care and, um, and appreciate them. And uh, it, it, this is very situational. So there's no perfect answer in delivering bad news. Uh, you know, it's like layoffs or, you know, uh, missed opportunities, but you have to allow, you have to make sure that people walk away feeling as though they are still appreciated that, there is something positive for them to work on. Uh, you have to get it. So it's very much a, um, uh, a coaching approach where you let people know, you know, what they're doing well, where they need to work on, as opposed to like, you, you don't want to sugarcoat. If you're going to deliver bad news, sometimes you have to be just clear and direct, um, but also be caring and not, uh, and not mean spirited, obviously, about it. You try and avoid the other shoe to drop. Well, you know, we're looking like this. But you don't want the person to feel like, uh oh, I can see the bad news coming. You want to avoid that. Uh, but 
clear and direct. I know that we were, you were hoping that this was going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. But here, I want you to know that you're valued. And here, we want, to, we want you to know that there are some steps that you can take. We want to work with you to take those steps to be able to, you know, if it's to going to the next level, or whatever it is, giving people um, something that they can walk away and go, you know, I didn't get what I wanted, but I did get something that's going to get me there. I was reading something yesterday that I thought was very interesting by a coach who was suggesting that the word feedback can kind of get your defenses up. If somebody says to you, well, I want to share some feedback with you, you will automatically think the worst. So to also just be careful, not only of your tone, and but also right. of your word choice, because there's certain That's words right. that are going to make you get your defenses. Yeah. Trigger words. Yeah. 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 Hope that Um, helps. Let me see if there's any other uh, questions. Make sure that we answer them all. I think that we did. Well, again, Rob, thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for your terrific questions. And I look forward to seeing you all next month. And everybody, shine on. Great. Renew, develop your executive presence, firm it up, and stay safe. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you all. Thank you.